This is our second session on 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 2, this rich, symmetrical, beautiful salutation. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, as we try to understand more fully God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope as they relate to the apostleship of Paul, open our eyes to the preciousness and the truth and the urgency of thinking of you, Father, as a Savior and what kind of hope that brings. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes we are so familiar with words that we use them without pondering what newcomers would say. I don't even know what that is referring to. In this case, God our Savior raises the question of Savior from what? And how does God's being a Savior shape Paul's ministry as an apostle? Let's take that second question first. Look at 2 Timothy 2.10. Paul says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He does everything he does as an apostle to help people who turn out to be God's elect obtain salvation. And so when it says here that he's an apostle by the command of a saving God, that's the effect it has on Paul. He lives for the salvation of sinners, which now raises the question, salvation? Save? Savior? From what? There's a whole worldview implied in that word Savior that many people do not grasp at all. Unbelievers don't know what they need to be saved from. So let's ponder this. Here's Titus 3, 3 through 7. We ourselves were once foolish and disobedient and led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, hating one another. That was Paul's condition, and it's the condition more or less of all people. We are sinners. That's the problem and God's response to it. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. Now, what's involved in this? Not because of works done by us in righteousness. We didn't have any righteousness to earn any salvation by doing good works. But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's one statement of what we are saved from. We're saved from the deadness that needs to be born again and the corruption here that needs to be renewed by the Holy Spirit. So one of the things we're saved from is this awful bent towards sinning described in verses 3 and uh, or in just verse 3. Keep going. Whom he poured out, the Holy Spirit, he poured out on us richly through Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Christ is our Savior as well as God the Father being our Savior. So that being justified by His grace. Now there's a second description. So there's the washing of regeneration because we're dead and need to be made alive and we're we're old and dirty and need to be renewed. And now we are under a condemnation and need to be legally set right with God that is justified in the court of heaven. Those are two meanings 
of being saved. He saved us by regeneration. He saved us by justification. Let's go further and see this further in uh, the rest of Paul's writings. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This was the main problem. You could say sin, walking in disobedience, contradicting God, not obeying him, not loving him, not admiring him, not worshiping him, not attending to him, has brought us into sin. But the main problem is God's response to sin is a legal and just and holy condemnation. We must escape this. And in Christ Jesus, we are saved from condemnation. Here's Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, that is, set right with God by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. This is the great problem. We're under condemnation. We're under the wrath of God. We need to be saved from the wrath of God. Jesus said it this way in John 3. Whoever believes in the Son, the Son of God, has eternal life, which is the opposite of eternal condemnation, hell. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So there, Jesus is the one who introduced this horrific interpretation of reality, namely, Human beings that don't find life in the Son of God are under, they remain under the wrath of God. Here's the role of Jesus in salvation in the future. You turn to God from idols, you Christians, to the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers, saves us from the wrath to come. The fundamental problem for all humanity is not all kinds of political issues, all kinds of psychological issues, all kinds of sickness issues, relational issues. Those are not the main fundamental worst problem. This is the problem of the world. And this is what God sent Christ to solve. And before we read this text in 1 Thessalonians 5, let me just remind you, the apostleship of Paul is being shaped and commissioned and commanded by God, our Savior, God, before there's a mention of Christ, is the originator of salvation. So consider these words in 1 Thessalonians. God has not destined. So there we have God's planning from eternity. God has not destined us for wrath. He hasn't destined his people for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the plan. How? He died for us so that whether we wake, that is, live or die, wake or sleep, we might live with him. Or consider 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. God saved us. God from eternity, you'll see that in just a moment, saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose. He is the one who originates salvation. That's why Paul, I think, here says, God our Savior. God is first and foremost our Savior. Jesus Christ comes in as the one who implements God's purpose and plan. But God is the one whose purpose and grace, which he, God, gave us in Christ. So God, the Father, 
in Christ Jesus gave us grace before the ages began. Pause and wonder. Before there was a creation, before there was a fall into sin, before there was any guilt or condemnation, God planned salvation for sinners. He planned grace, undeserved kindness towards sinners before the ages began. This is all of God, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus. So God's purpose originates salvation. Jesus implements salvation, who abolished death, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. One more passage to look at. Titus 2. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, or for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope. And the reason I quote this passage is because here, right after calling God our Savior, he calls Christ Jesus our hope. And that raises two questions. How does the hope, or what is the hope, or how does it relate to the salvation? And who is Jesus Christ in relation to God? And here we are at Titus 2. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope. That's the hope of 1 Timothy 1, 1, our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is of one glory with the Father, God, and he himself is in his glory, our hope. So Paul would answer the question, Jesus Christ is God, and the hope that he is, is the glory of God the Father and God the Son appearing in the last day. And Paul is serving a command as an apostle to bring this to bear on as many people as he can us included.